Okay. <clears throat> Let me know. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming uh, this morning. I'd like to talk with you all, obviously, about CATS. And uh, uh, that's an acronym, obviously, for the Clinical Antithrombotic Therapy Service. And a lot of you have seen CATS in the charts. Uh, you've heard about CATS in conversations. Um, but, and some of you know a lot about what CATS is, but a lot of you don't. And that's my bad to a certain extent. Not necessarily bad, but it's just a matter of finding the opportunity and letting this evolve to the point where it's something we can actually talk about as an entity. Um, the first thing you ought to know about CATS is that it is work in progress. The other thing you ought to know about CATS is that it, it represents a little bit of a change in paradigm uh, from what we're used to doing uh, in cardiology traditionally. Um, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. Uh, next slide. By the way, I'd like to introduce Emily Patel. Stand up, Emily. Because Emily is our partner at Population Health in CATS. And I'll explain why we have a partner like Emily in just a few minutes. But this is a partnership. And that's part of the change in the paradigm that I want to explain to everybody. So uh, Emily is part and parcel of this whole talk and this whole process. <clears throat> so what is the objective of CATS? By the way, I'll try to be brief here. And we can be informal. If anybody has any questions, just uh, put up your hand or yell out. Um, what are the objectives of CATS? Well, in, why is it? Uh, why does it exist? Why, have we, why are we trying to create it? Um, we are partnering with Population Health in this endeavor. That is, cardiology is partnering with Population Health. That in and of itself is somewhat of a change in paradigm. Um, we've had partnerships uh, over the years with various other departments. For example, we partner in a way with uh, research uh, because research uses our, our patients and we, uh, the physicians, uh, serve as uh, uh, investigators for various studies, local investigators. Um, and we partnered to a certain extent with pharmacy with respect to the ATU, for example. There are, uh, uh, pr there is precedence for partnerships, but with respect to this partnership with population health, it's a, it's a bit of a new thing because we're actually actively partnering with them in uh, patient care. And it's a relatively new process, and that's why I want to explain this to everybody. Um, <clears throat> so we're partnering with Population Health to provide guidance for very common antithrombotic issues on both inpatients and outpatients. Now, I'll explain right now when I say common antithrombotic issues. These are not the type of esoteric or complex hematologic or clotting problems that one would normally call a hematologist for, for example. Uh, this is not so much uh, trying to figure out if somebody has uh, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome uh, or uh, some bizarre clotting disorder uh, or a bleeding disorder such as hemophilia or something like that. These are much more common and are bleeding and clotting problems that we see every day in the hospital all over the hospital. Um, these are clinical issues, however mundane they may be, they are very high risk. And a lot of you already know this, that uh, the antithrombotic agents as a group, and that is the anticoagulants such as warfarin, uh, dipigatran, apixaban, the new DOEX, so to speak, and aspirin and plavix as a group are right up there neck and neck with the opiates as far as uh, the leading cause of emergency room admissions, the leading cause of major adverse effects that require hospitalization. Uh, so this is a, this believe me, the antithrombotic world is on health and human services radar. It's on federal radar. Uh, and we spend billions uh, as a country, we spend billions of dollars every year 
uh, trying to um, mitigate the problems associated with antithrombotic drugs, just as we do with the opiates. <clears throat> so, it's a very high risk problem, it's a very serious problem, um, and it's a problem that crosses multiple specialty lines. And that's where it is a little bit difficult to get our hands around with respect to cardiology, because it's not just a cardiology thing. And that's where we need the help of population health. It's more of a, uh, and, and this is growing throughout the country, um, even though we're a cardiology practice, there's no question about that. But these problems that we deal with probably more as a cardiology specialty than any other specialty actually involves multiple times other specialty services besides us. For example, antithrombotic drugs, I, I don't probably have to explain this a great deal to you, all antithrombotic problems and drugs involve orthopedics, uh, OBGYN, uh, all kinds of medical specialties, GI is a big one, neurology with strokes and intracranial hemorrhages, neurosurgical specialties with wound care, wound bleeding, post-operative bleeding, etc. Well, I could go on and on, but it, it crosses multiple specialty lines. And that in and of itself is a little bit of a problem getting our hands around it. It's not just within the Heart Institute. <clears throat> uh, the CATS, the service, is physician directed but APP managed. Now, I'll mention, it, mention the obvious to you already right now that it's not too much APP managed right now because our APP is on maternity. <laughs> and everybody knows that. But we're managing. Uh, we're managing. We, we're, we're not just going to put this on hold. Um, we, some of the things, we, we can't just replace Katie. Uh, for one thing, she's very, very good. The other thing is we don't have an APP that's just sitting around doing nothing. Uh, so uh, we're just going to have to, you know, put this together and keep it going for the next three months in somewhat of a patchwork fashion. The inpatient consults that Katie was doing uh, are being just done by all of the physicians, just like we had for years, except it's more of a identified CATS type of consult. But the physicians are doing them uh, instead of Katie. The education piece, as an outpatient, uh, uh, Jen Kreger has been gracious enough to, in her kind of uh, transition out from phones out into the private practice, which was kind of already taking place, she has been gracious enough to accept the responsibility for the education piece in the uh, CATS patients that come in as an outpatient, as much as she can, that is. Um, and We'll just kind of work, uh, uh, work as we can until Katie returns. Um, so uh, it's protocol driven. Now it's that's work in progress because we don't have all of our protocols in place. But this is something that is best done via protocol, uh, particularly when it gets to the point that the APP, like Katie, is doing it to a large extent on her own. Uh, we like to think that uh, it is. Uh, we like to uh, practice evidence-based medicine, and this is a topic that lends itself very nicely to evidence-based medicine because there's a lot of data out there. Unfortunately, it's not all in the cardiology literature, and it's not actually that well known by cardiologists and by people who really should know it. Uh, the, the data has to be uh, sought out, uh, but there's more data out there on these type of things uh, than one would think. Um, so anyway, we try to um, help out in that regard. And then finally, and this is where population health comes in, we would like to track, this is very important, we'd like to track outcomes. As you can probably imagine, the most obvious situation in this is an inpatient consult, and we get these all the time, uh, an inpatient consult where they call us and a patient's on warfarin or a patient's on a pixaban or aspirin, flaps, whatever, and they just dumped uh, three quarters of their blood volume into the toilet. And so they call us to ask us what to do. Well, it's pretty obvious. We stop the drug. <laughs> now sometimes it's not with warfarin. Um, it's, there's, sometimes the question comes up whether we reverse or not. 
okay? But most of the time, the inpatient piece, the acute piece, is pretty simple. You stop the anticoagulant. That's not why CATS is being created or CATS exists. That's not the hard part. The hard part comes a week or two later when the patient is at home, no longer in the hospital, or at a nursing home or wherever they are. They're no longer bleeding. The hospitalist is long gone. Their family doctor doesn't want to handle it because it's too high risk. We're long gone, and if the patient doesn't have a follow-up visit, nobody knows when to restart the patient's anticoagulant, or if to restart it. Nobody is a liaison between what went on in the hospital and the neurosurgeon who took care of the subgirl hematoma. Uh, you know, and, and consequently, and literature has shown that patients do most poorly uh, if they're on an anticoagulant and they bleed, and they're, they do more poorly if they're not ever restarted on their anticoagulant than if they are restarted in a reasonable time frame. Now that's absolute. Uh, the G GI bleeds, you don't just stop them and leave them off of them forever um, because they do worse because they're on the anticoagulant for a reason in the first place. And so somebody has to navigate them getting back on it. That's the hard part. And that's where CATS comes in, because the follow-up is very important, the outpatient follow-up. Um, and then, therefore, we track clinical outcomes. And this is becoming a widespread practice and recommended throughout the country uh, whenever, you know, uh, events and uh, adverse events are being tracked, clinical outcomes are being tracked, and reimbursement is being tied to this. And, a lot of you know that even better than I do. I mean, it's it's very important, and we really have to do this. And population health-driven programs like this are becoming more and more prevalent across the country. They're mostly now being seen in big academic centers. Uh, but it's going to get, uh, we're ahead of the curve in getting started on this now. Now, one thing I'll mention that is a future goal and we actually already kind of started this, but we, we couldn't continue it. Even before Katie left, we couldn't continue it. And that is, we would like, as part of CATS, we would like for all pre-ops and all anti-thrombotic holes, and you get to know what I'm talking about. We get them constantly. Um, we'd like those to be completed independently by APPs in the future. To the point where, unless it's real complicated and an APP has a question, they don't even go to physicians. Now, and they're done also, part and parcel of that is that they're done in an evidence-based manner via protocol. And they can be. There's no question about it. Katie actually started this. We, we had this as one of our initial goals. Katie actually started this with me, just my patients. And it was going pretty well. Uh, but she just became too busy. I mean, it was just too much. Uh, as you know, she has other responsibilities besides cats. So, we had to just put it on hold, and we particularly have to put it on hold since she's not even here. So I mean, I mean, it, that that is uh, a goal for the future. We haven't forgotten that or given it up. We want to do that, but we just have to wait until we get more APP power or manpower, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, next slide. Now the benefits. Well, the benefits. Uh, we get, we, we'd like to provide timely responses from the consulting team with evidence-based practices for anticoagulation management. Again, simple stuff, but if it's done poorly or in a wrong fashion, it can be devastating. Uh, we'd like to provide a transition of care for patients. You can think of it as an outpatient extension of the hospital or ER experience. For one thing, let me just bring up a couple things here. First of all, there is a big pressure, particularly on the hospitalist, to get patients out to shorten the hospital study as much as possible, as much as is safe. Um, you know, we don't like to keep people in the hospital longer than we need to. Well, <clears throat> every effort to do that is, is being looked at, and um, the DOACs, that is the direct oral anticoagulants, uh, the ones that are non-warfarin anticoagulants, that is Pradaxa, to use the brand names, Pradaxa, uh, Zarelto, uh, uh, Eliquis, um, 
These drugs have changed the landscape because, just give me an example, first of all, they're approved and they've been shown to be at least equivalent or better in treating DVT and pulmonary embolus. Well, there have been multiple studies out and the drugs are approved now to give to people when they come in the emergency room with the DVT and even an uncomplicated pulmonary embolus and send them home. Uh, I mean, send them home to the emergency room. Okay, well, that's great. That really shortens hospital stay. That's awesome. Except that now you have a patient out there on a drug that he's never been on before. He can't spell it. Yeah. He can't pronounce it. And he might not be able to get it. He might not. He may have sticker shock when he goes to the pharmacy. Uh, and he, you know, I, I mean, all kinds of scenarios. And this guy's out there on his own pretty much. Okay? He may have a follow-up, and you know what the ER, doc, the ER docs do? They call the family doctor, and they say, um, hey, can you see this guy in the family doctor? I say, yeah, I'll see him in about a month. Well, he'd be dead in a month, you know, or that's an extreme situation, of course, but, you know, I mean, it's a month's too late. I mean, he, if he can't get the drug, he'll go a month without the drug. Uh, he, these people, it's not their fault. These people need education, and they need education soon. And that's where CATS comes in, because the whole idea is for us to um, represent or, or uh, be available as a nimble, short-term follow-up for education, patient education, and navigation through these complex post-event type of things, like if they were in for a GI bleed and they um, need an endoscopy, uh, another follow-up endoscopy in a month. Well, uh, one of our jobs at, in CATS for the follow-up visit is to make sure they know where to go for that and make sure it's actually scheduled. Let me give you a case in point. I saw a 92-year-old who had recently had a pulmonary embolus and he was on a Pixaban for the pulmonary embolus. He comes in the emergency room with this unbelievable, this huge nosebleed. I mean, you know, championship nosebleed. and. Um, they treated the nosebleed, of course, and they put one of these rocket things in his nose, you know, hangs out his nose about six inches, you know, and it stopped the bleeding, and they called us to manage his anticoagulation, which we did, uh, and it was great, and the guy went home from the emergency room, supposedly with an ENT consult as an outpatient, because ENT put this thing in, or, you know, and they, so the guy comes back uh, for a CATS appointment, in five days, four or five days, and he comes in, and he's still got this thing in his nose. And this, this poor 92-year-old guy um, asked me the question, and I kid you not, he asked me the question, he says, Doctor, is this ever going to come out? He thought that he might have to have this thing in the rest of his life, and he really didn't know. And I said, well, where's your ENT appointment? He says, I don't know. I don't have any appointment with anybody else except this one. So we called and got him an ENT appointment that <coughs> afternoon. And he went over and got his rocket out. You know, it's okay. But I mean, you know, those are the kind of things that can happen. Uh, and we like to think of this service as uh, being an improvement on that. Okay, uh, next slide. Now, why, uh, that, that reason, that example right there is a reason for why, but there are all, MLA has uh, found some very good uh, examples in the literature of why we're doing this, and uh, this is not meant to be exhaustive, there are other examples of this, uh, there is a, but, but these, are, these are documented studies, um, uh, there is a significant rate of major bleeding following hospitalization for DVT and pulmonary embolus. The first 30 days post-discharge are critical to avoid, uh, ble uh, avoid bleeding episodes. Um, costs for recurrent VTE-related hospitalizations and 30-day readmissions are very high and negatively impact quality outcomes. And believe me, in these days, quality outcomes are on our radar. Would you not agree, Doug? Yes. Um, uh, next one, evidence-based guideline recommendations, anticoagulation therapy may reduce VTE-related readmissions, morbidity, mortality. And I would actually, 
that's a that's a soft statement when it says may reduce because there's literature out there that actually shows that it does. There's a study authored by a guy named Amin and others in 2015 that showed that uh, compared to warfarin, Doax and I'll specifically say Afixaban because it was the best of all three. Uh, Afixaban compared to warfarin reduced adverse events. Uh, by 1.8 percent, this is over a period of a year, reduced adverse events by 1.8 percent, reduced recurrent bleeding by 7.5 percent, um, and saved that hospital system $4,400 per patient year. That is per patient per year compared to warfarin. So in other words, we can, we can do better if we, if we follow the literature and do things right. Uh, transition of care programs for the treatment of DVTs have shown to be uh, safe, effective, and a cost-saving measure. Now, finally, there's a lot here about DVT and pulmonary embolus because, you know, probably the DOAX have affected that disease state probably more than atrial fibrillation. But it's also dramatically affected atrial fibrillation. Uh, and with all of our patients that are on DOAX, and particularly ones that um, get we have patients that we put on DOAX over the phone. And the reason is we detect atrial fibrillation by uh, pacemaker interrogations now and Holter monitors. And as soon as you see it, you, you response to the taxes, start this patient on uh, uh, Xarelto or, you know, and it may be a month if the patient gets put on it, but, you know, they don't come in for education for maybe a month or two or three. And uh, so that could be better. So DOAC education is very important. And then finally also dual antiplatelet therapy education and the constant reevaluation of the need. I mean, I can't tell you the number of patients I see on Plavix and they've been on Plavix for 15 years and nobody knows why. <coughs> I mean, they were put on it by some stroke or TIA they had in, you know, 1992 and you know, do they really need, because the bleeding risk of dual antiplatelet therapy is underappreciated. And all you got to do is make rounds over in the tower for a couple days and you'll see it. Okay, next slide. This is a slide that maybe all of you have seen, but this is how we get a con CATS consult from the tower or from any person who asks for a consult. And that is, as you can see, when you ask for a cardiology consult, if you're a hospitalist, or a hospitalist nurse practitioner and you ask for a um, CATS consult, well, you know, if you ask for a cardiology consult, this will come up. And you'll have a few choices here, as you can see, where the uh, red exclamation point is. And the first one is the CATS button. And although it's taking some time, it's actually not going too badly. Actually, the hospitalists are being pretty good when it's an antithrombotic or anticoagulation related issue, they're pretty good about hitting the right button, so to speak. And that's the first button you see there that's labeled CATS is the button that, that they push. Now, will the patient get seen if they push any other button? Of course they will. And the cardiologist will take care of the problem, even if it's hit general cardiology. So it's not going to hurt the patient. However, if they hit the CATS button, it will automatically go to Emily. Nothing else needs to be done. She'll have it. And that patient will be followed from now until perpetuity. <laughs> uh, anyway, but that, that's all that needs to be done to get the patient uh, into population health. Now, <clears throat> and, and consequently, I would like to appeal to all of you all, particularly the rounding nurses and everything, because when the, if you all know this, you probably actually all know this better than the physicians is that the type of consult that's, that's asked for comes up. It's in kind of small print, but it's right above. If the consult's linked and you hit the cons and you go to where the consult is, it says there, you know, which button was pushed, general cardiology, CATS, etc. And I, I would like for the rounding nurses to be kind of aware of this and to maybe, because the physicians will sometimes notice this, but a lot of times not. And you all know that as well as I do. And I would like for the rounding nurses to remind the doctors to say this is a CATS consult, or they hit the CATS button. 
And the doctor will say, well, what's that mean I have to do? By the way, the doctors have heard all this also from me. But, you know, the doctors will say, well, what's that mean I have to do? And the answer to that is nothing that you wouldn't ordinarily do. It's just another consult, except that we need to be reticent when the patient's ready to go home. We need to make sure that the patient has CATS follow-up. That's the key thing. The consult in the hospital will not change. I mean, we'll just do what needs to be done. Um, okay, next slide. Now, this is a following. This, the following, this slide was put together by Emily. And this is an audit of 152 patients that received a CATS consult between January and November of 2017, this year. Now, Katie was not part of the service until July, uh, as most of you know, but it's just a very quick summary. 126 patients had the correct consult order placed by the ordering provider. Uh, 26 um, had a missing or incorrect consult order. In other words, the, the right button was not pushed. The, cat, the consult button, button was not pushed. Uh, but that's actually not too bad. Um, and it says down here the missing or incorrect consult orders. How did we know them? Well, either I, either me, or Katie picked these up through manual tracking. The thing that concerns me more than anything else is that even when the correct consult order was placed, uh, I have a feeling that. The, the missing or incorrect consult orders, that 26 number, that's probably an underestimation because Katie or I probably didn't pick up most of them. We missed them. But because, you know, our tracking system was imperfect earlier in the year. And it pr probably still is imperfect, but it's getting a lot better. So anyway, that's the importance of hitting the right button. And it's also the importance of getting these people the appropriate people in for the appropriate outpatient follow-up. Uh, next slide. And we only have about a few minutes to go. So anyway, takeaways and questions from the audit. Uh, a continued focus of ensuring the appropriate consult order is entered into the system, pushing the right button. That's not really our responsibility, but it's our responsibility to educate our, our providers uh, with whom we work. Continued work in transitioning, that is scheduling, the inpatient CATS consult to a timely outpatient follow-up. And I think we have a lot more work to do in that regard. Because I just want to impress upon the rounding nurses again to try to get these patients in. And I know it's going to be tough uh, since Katie's gone for the next three months. But don't worry about my schedule. I will put myself out there to be double booked or whatever. And I talk to Shalon about this all the time. Anyway, uh, and then finally, continued, uh, we went to cardiology and population cells, continued promotion of CATS, and continued work to minimize the variations in anticoagulation management through the creation of evidence-based protocols. Next slide. Who do we see? Well, you all can read this just as well as I can, and it's basically the, the bottom line tells it anything involving antithrombotic therapy. Now these are things, granted, that cardiologists may not be historically used to seeing, at least on a large volume, for example, DBT and pulmonary embolism, but we'd like to. I mean, let's face it, cardiologists would like to conquer the world. So, but, but no, in, in, seriously, we don't mind seeing these because they're, they're vascular in nature, uh, and they're, uh, uh, it's not like we want to steal anybody's patients, but you know, with the CATS progress, with the CATS process, uh, we think we can provide these patients with meaningful and important uh, short-term follow-up that would improve their care. Atrial fibrillation, of course, um, uh, embolic stroke, uh, any bleeding complication while on an antithrombotic agent, uh, GI bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, etc., retroperitoneal hematoma. Uh, we would like to get involved in any of these things if they occur while on an antithrombotic agent. And that includes dual antiplatelet therapy and also triple antithrombotic therapy that we're seeing more and more. We try to avoid it as much as we can. And these are the patients who have had stents but who are on warfarin or Xarelto and they need that for their atrial fibrillation or their mechanical valve. 
but they also need aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor of some sort. And these patients are very high risk for bleeding. Basically, anything involving antithrombotic therapy. Next slide. Questions? That's about it. Thank you. Yes? Um, as a phone nurse, and I don't know about the other phone nurses, I am receiving more questions from patients who are saying, my PCP was told to handle my whatever, anticoagulant, and he wants me to call you. Now, they may or may not be our patient. Same thing coming from ER. They may or may not be our patient. But we... Same thing comes from where? ER? Some Did of you them say come ER? ER. Okay. Some of them come, they say, my PCP was told to do this after such and such. They may or may not be our patient. But where does that go as far as scheduling? Cats. And we can do that without an order. Uh, let me just, of what I'd like at this stage in the game, particularly since Katie's not here. Right. Personally, when, when Katie gets back, you go to her with these. Right. But this is happening more frequently. Like how frequently? Just a, just a ballpark weekly? figure. At least weekly, maybe more than once a week. And, okay, and well, schedule. those kind of situations uh, come to me for those for the, to for the time being. Okay, because yeah, I don't mind being bothered with off. those now. Granted, I'm not here, like this week, I'm not here. So, okay. uh, But I would like to at least pass judgment on those things okay. because most of the time we'd like to do it. Right. We don't turn down business. Well, I understand you know, that. I, and you know that. I, I just want it done in the proper fashion. Don't you think in that situation you call the PCP and get a formal order, put the cat's order that's in? That's and exactly what you need to do. I would encourage yeah. them to place okay. the... It's, place we have to educate down. them. Yes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Just you know, we take the call. And, or from ER, we don't get them in very soon. Well, you in, can see it's a... Well, I would particularly, ER, I'd particularly e like those patients from the ER. Okay. Right. In ER, most of the time, you can get the record, they're right there. You can right. see. Right. Well, and that's then, what I do. You yeah. read it and you see. And you can oh, put in an order. And this then, involves such and such. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Are you guys yeah. getting any of those? Because I have. Well, well please. But I'm glad you asked that question because what I don't want is for, and not that you would do this, I know, but I mean, I, I don't want you to say, um, we don't do that, or we're not no. interested in it. Uh, or we'll see you in a month. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> right. Right. Don't do that. I mean, right. do something. And uh, if you have, just call me if you have to. I will. But, you know. Or, yeah. Okay, that's what I needed to know. Thank you. Any other questions? I, Emily, do you have anything to say? Anything to add? No, no. That's all of it. We're trying, we're, between the two of us, we are in a kind of an ongoing um, manner of uh, educating our, uh, the, our colleagues with whom we work, uh, the hospitalists. And I'd like to get with the primary care physicians. That's a little bit more difficult because it's such a huge group and they're dispersed. Um, but I'd like to do that because, you know, cats can be a purely outpatient thing, too. I've gotten outpatient consults from various primary care physicians, but it's hit and miss. I've, that's happened to me for a few years. But I kind of like to make it that part and parcel of cats also. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you all. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yes. First one is my daughter is asking me this one um, because she's a pharmacist. Pharmacist, right. There, because she gave me a couple examples where a cardiologist was seeing the patient, and then somebody, and then you or someone else was addressing the patient's coumadin on a daily basis. Right. Her question is, what happens on the weekends when you're not there? Well, that's a very good question. And first of all, if I'm actively managing the patient's uh, warfarin. If it's just me doing it as part of cats, I always make arrangements for either me to look at the patient on the weekend, even if I'm not on, okay. or somebody else, or I turn it over to pharmacy on Friday afternoon or something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, you really shouldn't have two cooks doing it. Right. Two cooks spoil the soup. So, and I'd like to take that opportunity also is that this cats process is not meant to take the place of what pharmacy does in following. Um, PTTs on heparin or INRs on Coumadin on inpatients. They do an excellent job at that. This is not meant to replace that or supplant that in any way. And I didn't mean it that way. I know, I know. But I mean, there are a couple of patients that I've seen that are very complicated 
that I've kind of done the uh, warfare and management on a day-to-day -day basis um, over the tower. And I either usually keep doing it on the weekend or I turn it over to the pharmacy or something like that. Okay. Now my second question yeah. is, pertains to the one like when um, you brought up the NOAX and we put them on over the phone? Yes. So if we put them on over the phone, do we put in a consult for cats so that they're educated in I, a week or? I would, I would like that. I, I, yes, I would like that. Okay. In fact, okay. uh, we're trying to, uh, this very thing is happening right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, we tried to get in a patient today to cats who, for education, who was an elderly lady who was put on, I think, something, um, RIV, on the phone a few days ago because atrial fib came up, popped up on a Holter monitor. Well, she didn't want to come in today. She's kind of elderly and, you know, you can't force patients to come in. But she does have an appointment in about three weeks. That's a little too long for my liking, but I guess, you know, it's a, but she wouldn't come in today. Um, but we tried. Okay. And that's, yeah, I'd like that. Okay. Uh, I think it'd be a good idea. Now, the one thing you guys have to realize is CATS is not meant to be a permanent residence for these patients. Right. It's not a permanent clinic. We see them once, maybe twice, and then we get them back to wherever they need to go for long-term management. And, and Dr. Wilson, I wanted to make sure you're aware that we have a lot of patients that we start on, like Stacy said, that are an AFib. I'll put in an order for the ATU clinic, and they do education for NOACs. Well, that's okay. That's an option, You know, too. for those patients that live in LaGrange, and yeah. they're, they're 85 years old, and they can't get down here, and they say, I just saw Dr. Hager. I don't want to come down for cats. Well, then I put in a referral no, for I, ATU. I understand that, yeah. but I'm talking about with the clinic. Well, that's okay. That's an option. Yeah. yeah. Would they also need to be verified with whoever their cardiologist is, say Dr. Hager's? I mean, would you have to say, yes, I want them with cats, or do you want it just flat that that's what you would prefer as an option? Does it need well, to go the to physicians the have been spoken to about this, and I they know about it. I don't know if it needed to go to the primary or not. I, I don't think this needs to go to the primary. Okay. Uh, it's more of a situation. If the patient's willing to do it, I mean, we're not trying to change the person's medicines or schedule any tests or actually dictate therapy. Therapy's already been dictated. <coughs> They're already on the drug. We just want to educate them about it. Yeah. You're really yeah. just extending it from the hospital because it's overloaded information in the hospital. And when they right. discharge, you don't know what happens. Right. Yeah, we're talking about right. outpatient. Right. 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 So. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you all very much.